Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. All right, we're back again for lecture four of week one in the course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher from Purdue. And today we're going to talk about electrons. Last lecture we developed some ideas for lattice vibrations and phonons. And today uh, we'll focus on electrons uh, and we will also recognize that other courses in the NanoHub U series have done a lot of really good work in developing uh, ideas for uh, electron transport, mainly driven by potential differences as opposed to thermal differences. But still, we won't go into too much depth. Um, later on, we'll pick up a few other ideas about electrons, but today we want to talk about free electrons. So that would be electrons and metals. So if we had, we, we had talked earlier about, uh, about the bands of electrons and different uh, quantum states. And what happens is if one of those bands is, um, is at a lower energy entirely uh, than another, then we have what's called a band gap. So that's shown uh, on the right side. And that, if we have a large band gap, then the, the gap is very large in energy space, and we call that an insulator. If that gap exists, but it's fairly small, say of order of one electron volt, then we have the middle situation, and we have a semiconductor. So there are some things that we can do as engineers and scientists to make these two bands communicate with each other, even though at zero temperature and all other things being um, unaffected, then we would have the entire bottom band, called the valence band, occupied with electrons and the entire top band would be unoccupied. That's the conduction band. However, if there is an overlap in the energy states, uh, so you could think about a p orbital and a d orbital, for example, um, or an s orbital and a p orbital, if there is an overlap, then what happens is that the two bands can start to share electrons with each other. That's part of that hybridization process that we talked about before. And when we have that sort of overlap, then the electrons have an easy time moving through energy and real space. And then we have what's called a metal. So that's what we're going to talk about today, some of the mathematics behind how we would handle a metal. So we start with uh, with the idea that these higher energy electrons, that means away from the core orbitals, um, are free to move from atom to atom. So they're really not bound by, uh, by the, the, uh, the ions that form the, that, where the nuclei of the atoms exist. So that's, that's sort of the biggest approximation um, to the free electron model. In general, whether we're dealing with, uh, with ionic interactions or not, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation in order to understand how the electrons move. And what we're really after today is what are these energy states that the electrons can take and how are those associated with the wave vector or wavelength. So if we look at Schrodinger's equation sort of in its uh, big form but, but still steady state, so this is, uh, this is sometimes called the time invariant form of Schrodinger's equation. Then we see this, we have the equation and psi is the electron wave function. And that's going to give us an idea of where the electrons like to sit, although it doesn't give us a definitive answer because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Generally speaking, another the second term in the equation, which is V times psi, that involves the potential energy. And here, that's where we would plug in the ionic contribution. But we're going to neglect that in this case, and we're just going to focus on the relationship between this, uh, this Laplacian term on the left and the right side, which is the energy eigenvalue and uh, multiplied by psi. So this is a classic eigenvalue problem. I told you before that these, uh, that these uh, wave functions, psi, uh, are related to the position, but they don't give us a, a perfect prediction of the, of the position. So we have only a probability. So when we take the magnitude of psi squared, that means psi is generally imaginary or has an imaginary component. And so we have to multiply psi by psi star, which is its con complex conjugate. Um, and then when we do that, we will assume a form of the solution. And once again, we're going to use a plane wave type of solution. And here we have this, this K. It looks a lot like what we did for phonons, 
I will, in the course of this class, I'm going to do a couple of things that are uh, maybe a little bit unconventional. Um, one of them is I will use lowercase k for electrons. Right. And before, as you'll remember, for phonons we used capital K. Right. They're both wave vectors, but they're of different carriers. Now often in the literature you'll see a distinction made, but instead of using a capital K for phonons, they'll use Q for phonons. I don't like that so much because Q, lowercase Q or uppercase Q, has sort of a special place for thermal engineers. It's usually, um, it's usually the symbol for a heat flow rate. So we're going to use capital K for phonons and lowercase k for electrons just to keep, keep them distinct. But when we plug in this assumed form of, of the solution for psi into Schrodinger's equation, then we calculate the energy eigenvalues. It's actually a pretty straightforward thing. We won't go through it. Uh, but when we do that, we find that the energy values go as k squared. So that means that energy has a parabolic relationship with k, the wave vector. And that becomes important. It really forms the basis of much of electrical engineering theory and electrical transport theory. Now there are some classical concepts that we can bring into play uh, when we think about energy. One of those is momentum. So momentum, as classically defined, is mass times velocity, and that's shown in the first equation. And energy is one-half mass times velocity squared. That all comes back from freshman physics. So we can then form a relationship between velocity and energy, and then therefore between momentum and energy. So this all comes up to this point here that I'm and a highlighting with the cursor uh, comes from classical considerations. Now what we'll do is plug in our dispersion relation. That was the energy versus K relationship, our parabolic re relationship. And we find that momentum, when we do some simple algebra, is simply reduced Planck's constant, that's H bar, multiplied by the wave vector K. And so if we then put that into vector form, we find that momentum equals H bar times the vector of wave vector k. So that's a that's something that if we want to kind of go back to quantum or classical considerations we can do if we know the wave vector then really we know the momentum it's just uh, multiplied by a constant to get the momentum. What we're going to do now is think about the allowed states of k and energy just like we did for uh, for phonons with capital K and frequency. So what we'll do is we'll do the particle in a box problem. Many of you have probably seen it, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. But what we'll say is that if we have a cube that has sides L, L by L by L, and we have periodic boundary conditions, so that's the way to sort of make that cube expand into, into a larger space, um, we say that the, this wave function psi has to equal itself every length L in any dimension. When we apply that periodic boundary condition to the particle in a box, um, to that assumed plane wave solution, we find that we have a restriction that says that e to the i times kl, whether it's x direction, y direction, or z direction, that has to equal 1. And now this starts to look a lot like what we did for phonons, because for phonons, when we wrap the chain around, remember that length l was the number of atoms times a, where that the a was the lattice constant, and also in that case the interatomic distance. So this, this constraint gives us allowed values of kx, ky, and kz, um, where these n, nx, ny, and nz just march through all of the integers. And so what we'll find, and this is, this is an important result that we're going to use over and over again, each allowable state in k space is separated by a distance of 2 pi over L. And that means that each, each allowable state in k-space occupies a cube of volume 2 pi over L cubed in k-space. So 2 pi over L all cubed in k-space. And we're going to use that a lot for electrons. We'll also use it for phonons as we, as we proceed forward. Now, we have to, for electrons, we have one little nuance, and that is that the Pauli exclusion principle comes in 
and we can only have two electrons of opposite spin in any k space in any k state whereas for phonons you'll remember that that our occupation number could be really any integer and then the average we, we would take the average what we'll do in this case is consider a capital n number of electrons we'll take them at 0 kelvin so we're not going to worry about temperature at this point we're going to do that once we get to some of the statistics and then we'll say that in k-space, k-space, um, we're going to make a, a sphere in k-space, and we're going to say that a number n prime will fit, uh, n prime electrons will fit into a sphere of volume 4 pi over 3 times k cubed. That's just a sphere in, in k-space. And then divided by this volume of one state, and remember, each state has two spins, so that's the, the prefactor 2. And as we proceed through this, we see that in this, in this space, we have then a relationship between the number of electrons and the volume in k-space, um, k-cubed. So what we do now is we'll set n, the total number of electrons to n prime, and we find that there's sort of a maximum wave vector, kf, which is this radius of the sphere that fits all of the electrons that we have. So these are all of the free electrons. And all of those free electrons have a density. So that is the number of electrons, that's capital N, per unit real space volume, V. So we'll call that eta sub E. So this gives us an idea that there's a, a maximum wave vector that is related to the number of free electrons that we have. The more, the higher the number of free electrons that we have, the higher that value of the, the k vector. It has a subscript on it because it's called the Fermi wave vector. There are other Fermi metrics that I'm sure you've heard more about in the past. So some of the other, uh, some of the others include the Fermi energy. That's a very popular one. So that's just plugging in that Fermi wave vector which comes from really from counting electrons, right, or electrons per unit volume. Um, the Fermi wave vector squared, and we, it's essentially just our parabolic relationship. So the, the Fermi energy is related to the Fermi wave vector, which in turn is related to the electron density, eta sub e. The Fermi velocity, if we go back to that idea about momentum, the Fermi velocity is just h bar times the Fermi wave vector divided by the mass of an electron, and again, that can be related to the number density of electrons. And then the Fermi temperature, so heat transfer engineers, we like to speak of things in terms of temperature often. So the Fermi temperature, which is not all that common, there are other equivalent temperatures that are used mostly for phonons, and we'll get to those. But the Fermi temperature is just the Fermi energy divided by KBT, and again, that can be related to the number of electrons, number density of electrons. So let's look at this from an uh, energy space standpoint. What happens is, down here in this, at these low energies, we have what are called core electrons. They're not participating. They're bound to the nucleus. And so they don't participate, and we sort of ignore those. And then we get up to the point where we have the bottom of our conduction band, and we'll call that, that energy level zero. So we get to choose that. The, energy, the zero energy datum we get to pick, um, in, in, at least in terms of electrical energy. And... Then we fill up the allowed states. Remember, we have Pauli's exclu exclusion principle, which uh, makes these states fill up fairly quickly. And then we rise up to the Fermi level. So everything below the Fermi level at absolute zero Kelvin is occupied. And then we still have some room in our conduction band for other electron states, but none of them are filled at, at zero Kelvin. Um, and then ultimately, we'll get up to the place where, or to an energy level where if an electron had that amount of energy, it would actually spill out of the material. And that is the vacuum level. And the difference between the vacuum level and the Fermi level is called the work function. So we will do some things later on with electron emission. So how, how do electrons emit out of a material, especially if they're thermally stimulated? In which case, uh, though that work function will become important. So that's all I had for today. I appreciate your time, and next time we're going to pick up, uh, we're going to go back to phonons a little bit and do some examples. Thanks.